I'm Dr. Bill Adams, and this is No Spin Live, everybody's favorite program where they learn about hot topics in plastic surgery from the world's best plastic surgeons. Today, we're gonna to be talking about fillers, new breast implants, the butt, new injectable fat dissolvers, and eyelid surgery. Joining me is Dan Del Vecchio from Boston, Massachusetts, Rich Restipa from New Haven, Connecticut, Stephen Camp from Fort Worth, Texas, and Rick Zinowitz from Providence, Rhode Island. Guys, let's get into it. Let's talk a little bit about fillers. You know you can put those in the nasolabial folds to fill those out, but what about things like around the mouth or under the eyes? Can you do that, and is it beneficial to patients? Dan Delvecchio, you wanna lead us off? Yeah, Bill, I mean, I think fillers are great. I think that you've gotta think about off the shelf, lunchtime, come in, come out, versus fat grafting, and you know, this whole uh, science of nano fat grafting that's kind of taking over that patients need to know about small little particles of fat probably rejuvenate better the problem is it's a longer procedure two hours in the office I think fillers definitely have a role um, there are some safety issues around the eye and I'm sure we'll get into that but I think fillers are great Stephen Camp what do you think uh, where, where else can we use fillers fillers are great to really shape and mold the face in a positive way um, I found that treating the temples um, and areas around the, the mid face and cheeks are uh, really forgiving and beneficial to patients. Um, they're quick, easy to tolerate, um, and really associated with any very little complications like bruising or downtime. So those things are uh, well received and um, great treatments for patients and certainly a good option. Rick Sinowitz, what do you think? Uh, the eye can be a place, I think you can put fillers, but it can be dangerous. So one of the <clears throat> you know, biggest boons to injection re recently is a, a micro cannula. I know it's been used in Japan and in Europe for a number of years, also South America, but it's more recently available here in the United States. It takes a lot of the worry out of injecting because you're presenting a, a, a blunt tip to the tissues, which is very unlikely to penetrate a, a vessel and cause some uh, emb embolic phenomenon. So I found that it's much easier to layer the material down. It's not uh, heaping blood and, and serum onto the, the tissues that you're trying to augment. So you get a more predictable outcome, I think. All right, Dr. Restifa, you're gonna have the last comment on this. Sum it up for us. Yeah, I'm gonna be a contrarian here. In the aging phase, are we dealing with volume deficiency? Or are we dealing with skin laxity? I would say that fillers, sure, they can be used, but they should be used in limited quantities. Okay, great stuff. Rich, I'm gonna stick with you. There's a new breast implant out there. There's been lots of breast implants that have been approved now in the United States, which is incredible. But the Allergan, Natrell, Inspira, soft touch implant, what's the deal? More of the same, Bill. Um, you know, it's a slightly different implant. It's, it's, the difference is more in terms of marking than it is in, in something that the patient will actually experience. It's uh, just another option. Rick Senowitz, what do you think? I don't really think that the, <clears throat> the inserts of the implants have made a, you know, a significant contribution other than in the, in the breast reconstruction patient that really does probably make a big difference to, to thwart off rippling and, and the appearance of ripples in the upper pole. But, uh, you know, the problem with shaped implants is, is they can turn. And, uh, and so I think rounder implants are probably gain, gaining uh, some of the ground that they lost to the, uh, the shape market uh, over time. Steve, what do you think about this? I think that I really agree with a lot of things that uh, Rick just said. Um, really, the fill material is reserved for very select patient populations. Uh, in my practice, I do a fair amount of reconstruction, so the, the skin is very thin unforgiving um, so sometimes the fill material and the volume of the fill to the capacity of the implant shell um, has also changed that allows us to have less rippling in those uh, parts of the breast and give them a better result and certainly in some secondary or revision cosmetic procedures it has a benefit but really traditional gel implants still are a great workhorse in my practice. Some have said that this more optimally filled breast implant could last longer it's more filled and there's less wrinkle in the shell. Del Vecchio, I'm sure you have an opinion on this. Yeah, Bill, I, I, let's just keep it really simple. There are three constituents here. There are the implant manufacturers who are just motivated to make new devices like DOS 2.0, DOS 3.0, blah, blah, blah. You've got patients who want good outcomes and you have plastic surgeons who need to figure out what to use. Way too much emphasis on the implant. I think that we're entering into a phase in breast surgery now, Bill. You and I have had this debate for years. Respect for the soft tissue. We heard the, the last surgeon talk about rippling. 
Rippling is nothing more than inadequate soft tissue. We're entering a phase now where we can actually add soft tissue to the breast over the implant. I think if you've got adequate soft tissue, Bill, you can put a hockey puck in there and it'll look good. The point here is that respect for the soft tissue will dictate your result. Way too much emphasis on the implant size, shape, blah, blah, blah. And I think that that's where breast surgery is going, composite breast augmentation, implants I, and fat. I wanted to say I really feel strongly about this, Bill. You know, you, you take a pancake, a Frisbee-type implant, those low classic profile implants that basically would fold at the inframemory fold. They, they suffer from fatigue flaws so early. And, and I'm certain if you were to compare them, which the implant manufacturers don't seem to give us the, you know, the, the true data on that. The fatigue flaws that will develop in that type of implant compared to a round, full-filled uh, implant has got to be significantly worse. Let's move on. We're going to talk about the butt. Now, starting with Dan. Dan, is it cultural? And tell me, what in the world is eye seconds? Buttock augmentation craze, it's taken over the world. It's, it's not just cultural. I think it came it initiated in the U.S. culturally with a new middle class of people who are more interested in butts than they are in breasts. The butt to waist ratio is actually very important too. You want a really wide hip and a really snatched or narrow waist. That's the aesthetic in a lot of cultures. But what's happened, Bill, is it's taken over the world. In Russia, two years ago, they laughed at me. This year, I did a butt aug in Russia. You were there. It's taking over Europe. It's taking over South America. Everyone loves the butt. Rich Restifo, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think it's, it's a big craze. Um, I think we're gonna ride it. Um, give the patients what they want. Dr. Zinowitz, what's your thoughts on uh, this cultural thing? Is it a real deal? Well, I, I totally think that the Caucasian you know, part of the population is late to, to the table for this and they're gonna catch on real fast. It, it, it will be something that will be a very quick slope back down to, to uh, our native uh, American population, which tends to be more, more Caucasian, at least at the moment. Steve, what are your thoughts? I agree with a lot of these comments, and I think um, you know, one of the things is we're talking about different cultures or even class, but it's very hard for us to define the aesthetic for any given region. Um, or even really time period, I, I think we're gonna find that things evolve slowly over time. But really, the, the buttock is kind of the last frontier of contouring. We found new innovative strategies that work to give patients a ratio um, that makes them feel more in balance and pretty. Um, and as long as that's done with a taste that suits the patient in a safe way, I think it's a great thing. Okay, Delbecca, you're gonna have to explain this to me. There's some new syntax that's come up with this buttock augmentation craze. It's called eye seconds. What in the world is that? Bill, eye seconds is simply defined as the number of seconds or milliseconds that you can look at an erogenous body part and not get caught. So if you're walking in a mall and you're walking by a woman or a man and you stare at something on them, it's really hard to do for more than a quarter of a second. You can kind of look and then you have to look away. If on the other hand, the person is ahead of you, typically the butt, there's no eyes in the back of the head, so you can stare at that butt for a long time. My point is the butt has really improved our eye seconds. Post office, let this person cut in line. Um, you're walking in the mall, you go to the Verizon store, you let that person go ahead in line. This is what my patients tell me all the time. They say, you know, since I had my butt augmentation done, people let me cut in line at the post office and at the Verizon store. You seeing the same thing in Rhode Island, Rick? I haven't had the time to think about it, but it makes perfect sense. I, I, I'll go with Dan's assessment. I think we're all laughing too hard. I don't know, Steve, like Texas? We live in Texas. I, I don't know. I, I personally, I, I think we all um, want to thank Dan for improving our uh, line waiting experiences. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it really knows no boundaries, whether it's the post office or the grocery store. I mean, truth be told, uh, I think he makes a great point. Um, and um, it's a very interesting concept. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, it's certainly a lot, a lot of fun to talk about. All right, well, let's move on to the fat dissolver. Kybella was acquired by Allergan. 
It's an injectable material that dissolves fat. Can it be used in other areas? For example, the bra fat roll in front of the arm that women hate, or maybe an area in the thighs or calves. Uh, what do you think, Rick? What, what are your thoughts on this? If you, want to, if you want to buy it by the gallon, maybe they can change the, the cost factor. You know, what they've done, unfortunately, is they told us that it would work with this minute amount of dose. It would be, I think, six, six cc's would do it for the average patient. And then they doubled it recently. So, you know, that is passed on to the consumer. It becomes prohibitively expensive, not to mention the you know, allusion to the frog. Um, as soon as that stuff goes in, you get this blimping of the entire submental region, which lasts for literally f for about five days. So unless it's scarf wear, it's not going to happen in Dallas except for maybe this morning. Um, but you know, up in the Northeast, come and get your Kybella during the winter. Steve, what do you think about this whole deal? Well, you know, um, I think that it's gr another great way for us to treat our patients. Um, I, I have expanded the use of that in my practice um, in select patients. Um, I do tell them it's off-label, so I think one of the things we need to know about is the fact that Kybella is indicated for use on-label underneath the chin. Off-label, I think it can safely be used, just like we use Botox off-label or other fillers off-label in places where we're not necessarily uh, intending to inject right away. So along the bra roll um, or an area of stubborn fat on the thigh, it works well for the patient who's interested in a quick procedure with little downtime that's easily camouflaged. So to Rick's point earlier, you know, a bra roll can be injected in less than 15 minutes. Patients can leave and appreciate some degree of fat dissolving in an area that's well hidden. Rich, what about you? You think uh, you see a place for it outside the chin? Maybe someday, but you know what? It, it's been around for two years. I mean, I don't think we know how to use it under the chin yet. I don't think it's time yet to uh, expand its indications until we really understand it. Okay, so Dan, you, I mean, you do a lot of fat addition, fat subtraction. I mean, can it be used for just like a little area after surgery that has a little too much fat? I'm sitting here thinking about Kybella. I'm thinking about fat in general. And again, I want to try to break it down in a very simplistic way. You can suck it out, you can freeze it, you can dissolve it. Um, the way you freeze fat with, with cool sculpting is you have to put it between two paddles and sit there for an hour. Now no one can put two paddles between your neck because then you'll choke it to death so I think Kybella is a natural option there. But I think in all these other body parts that you're talking about, bra rolls, thighs, what have you, you pro and you don't want surgery, you're probably better off having something like cool sculpting which is a little more controllable. There's definitely a dose response issue with Kybella. They, they dosed it too low in the beginning, but you can overdose with Kybella and have you know, problems. So I would tell you that my, my prediction is it's gonna have a limited role in the neck. The remainder of the non-surgical patients will go with cool sculpting. And let's not forget, Bill, liposuction is a pretty safe operation and you can get really good results with it. All right, that's good stuff. Our last topic is eyelid surgery, so blepharoplasty. You know, a lot of people are interested in this. It's a very popular type of plastic surgery procedure, but patients are worried about coming out looking weird. The eye is a very unique structure, and if your eye changes shape, it makes the whole face look strange. So how, how do we avoid that, Dan? Well, you know, this is kind of like, if you live long enough, you kind of see the cycling of things in life, and you know, I've lived that long, so. You know, when I was a resident, we would just take skin out and fat and skeletonize everyone. They would look like Kirk Douglas. Um, that's not a good look. I think that we've entered a realm in eyelid surgery where we're trying to preserve the natural fat of the orbit, take out some excess skin, deal with the muscles. But I think overall, we've come to a much better place with anti-aging. I, I think that the over-sculpted eyelid is a really unattractive thing. And that's why we end up putting more fat in the upper and lower eyelid later. Um, but I think that it's a, it's a trend right now for us to respect the soft tissue more and keep the volume of the orbit. But along those lines, you know, there's aging of the tarsal plate and everybody seems to forget about that. So you, you talked about Renee Zellweger, I think, Bill. And uh, you know, if you don't tighten that tarsal plate, you end up with more scleral show which is what older people have, and it makes their eyes look big. Well, that's not a natural look. If you look at younger people, they have a little tighter almond-shaped eye, 
and that's what we're looking for. So I apologize uh, to, to everyone that thinks that tightening the lower lid is, is you know, making the white of their eye get smaller, but that's what happens when you do it, and you need to do it. Why do you do it? You do it so you don't have this look. Remember Clockwork Orange? That's what you're trying to avoid. So we tighten that on purpose, and it doesn't last forever. It lasts for several months, but it does the job. So be prepared for that. Steve, what comments do you have on this? I mean, I think uh, you know, conservative preservation um, of structures is, is really the movement, and, and I agree with that philosophy. Um, I think that a lot of the times we see people look like they've lost their identity. It's a result of perhaps over-aggressive moves. Sometimes these surgeries that are done may be technically performed well, but the, the application and analysis of that particular operation to a patient maybe just doesn't work. So um, in my practice, I think staying conservative with patients, uh, making sure that we offer them an expectation that will kind of uh, make them look nice and normal and not unnatural um, is, is important. Um, and so we have a variety of ways to do that. So Rich, is too much change not good? Sure, I would, I mean, the best way, the simplest way to avoid <clears throat> the done look is to do less. And I would agree with uh, Steve that conservatism <clears throat> is almost always a good thing. I think you can always go back and do more, but it's hard to go back and do less. Great information. I think I've learned a lot today. I'm sure our viewers have as well. If you want to see more of this, you can find it at theplasticsurgerychannel.com.